Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? I'm apparently the Reverend Logan Martinez. You're welcome for that. <laughs> All right. How many of you guys have been really enjoying Fit February? No? Yeah, some of you. Mixed emotions, 50-50. Some of you forgot. It's okay. That's why I bring it up to remind you. Hey, if you haven't started, go ahead and get started. It's good. There's still half a month left. You can do a lot in like 15 days. Amen? So give you, I'll share, so if you're like, man, I'm not sure that I can do it. Let me tell you something. So I started two weeks before February, so I'm in like my fourth month. I've lost about 50 pounds. So it's not, <laughs> that's not to get praise, but that's to tell you that, hey, trust me, if I can do it, most assuredly you can do it. Because there's nothing awesome in me. I just decided to trust God with it and to be disciplined, and that's what it's all about, right? Because we've been talking about renewing the mind, having a renewed mind, going to the cross, right? Denying our flesh. There's no greater way to deny your flesh than to say no to some spaghetti, huh? Or whatever your food is, carne asada, something with a green chili saddle, whatever it is. <laughs> All right, well, this morning we're going to be talking about faith and endurance. How many of you guys love faith? How many of you guys are excited about endurance? Yeah, you will be after this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning to be able to worship you, to spend time with you. Holy Spirit, I ask right now, God, that you would prepare our hearts for this word. Believing, Lord, that this is the word for this, this moment in time, that it is what you want, it is what we need, and Lord, we're ready to receive it. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? The water does a body good. All right, here we go. So we're talking about faith and endurance. These are going to be the points. One, consider your trials pure joy. Number two will be don't waver, don't quit. And number three, my favorite, will be missing on this slide. Oh, do what the word says. <laughs> so let's talk about it. Here we go. Number one, consider your trials pure joy. Say joy. James 1-2 says this, dear brothers and sisters, say that's me. When troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. What? Have you guys ever thought for a moment, think about the thing you're going through right now, whatever that is. Does joy come to mind? No. It's frustration. It's anger. Something along the lines of, God, why is this happening? Right? Am I hitting some points for you? But what does the Bible say? Dear brothers and sisters, that's us. When troubles of any kind of what kind? Any. So it's not certain things here or there. It's whatever comes your way. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. The first thing you need to know is that joy is an attitude of a renewed mind. If you don't have a renewed mind, this is impossible for you. Does that make sense? In order for us to have pure joy in the midst of our trials, you have to go to the cross, deny yourself, and choose the joy that God will give you in the midst of your trials. What is joy? It's a noun, which is a person, place, or thing. So it's a thing. <laughs> no? All right. A feeling of great pleasure and happiness. I can tell you in some of the trials that I've gone through, that's not the feeling I've ever gotten. Like, I've never gone through something and go, man, God, this is so good. Thank you for, for me losing my house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, thanks for my car breaking down. You're so good, Jesus. Because that's crazy, right? But that's not what it's talking about. When we talk about joy, it's something that's internal. It's an attitude internally because we know that God has the victory. So it's not, wow, God, thanks so much for my car breaking down. Thanks so much for this or that. It's, God, I know that you're good and that the outcome's going to be good. You see the difference? One is a crazy person. Joyful for no reason. Don't hang out with those people. Pray for them. But the other is an attitude saying, God has a victory, so I must have joy because I know that God's going to give me the victory. Is that good? So triumph is also a noun, person, place, or thing. It's a thing. The state of being victorious or successful. Say victorious. Say that's me. You see, when you go through trials... The reason why James says, brothers and sisters, talking to us, the church, to consider it pure joy, an opportunity 
for great joy. An opportunity being something you have to choose. Because trials can come and you can choose to not have joy. You can choose to be negative. You can choose to be cynical. You can choose to get depressed. You can choose every other response other than joy. And you may think no one notices, but we see it on your face. <laughs> Man, you wouldn't believe what I'm going through. Well, judging by your face, I can tell it's something pretty big. <laughs> but we need to have joy because God has given us a triumph. God has given us a victory. A person that, it is, that has applied the cross to their lives and lives according to the renewed mind has the capacity to consider it a pure joy. Like I said, because they know that God is going to make them stronger. Our endurance is increased so as to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, God's desire for you is that you would be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But that doesn't happen just in the good times of your life. Testing doesn't happen when things are good, right? When things are good, it's really easy to have faith. Man, my job is so good right now. I got tons of money coming in. My health is good, family's good, kids are good, everyone's good, 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 good. It's easy to have faith, to say, praise you, God, God, you're so good, and you should. You should praise God in those times. But it's much more beneficial to have the same attitude in times of testing. Why? Because God wants to make you perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When you understand that God has a plan for you in your trials, that there are opportunities to develop you, then you'll begin to pray and act differently. How many of you guys in a trial have ever said, God, take this away from me? Or God, I wish this would go away. <laughs> or you've told someone, man, I hate this, I wish it would go away. That's a fleshly response. You see, our flesh desires to get out of it. It wants an out. It doesn't wanna go through trials. It doesn't wanna be disciplined. It doesn't want to trust God. It doesn't want to trust what it can't see. You see, faith requires you to see with, with eyes that only God can give. You can't see with your regular eyes things of faith. You can only see what you see. Let me give you an example. So someone in your family has cancer. You look at that situation and you go, oh my God. Like that's devastating. Your natural eyes can only see what's in front of it. But when you submit yourself to faith, you can see what God has planned. And claim the victory and triumph because you know that God has a plan. Amen? And what's his plan? It's healing. We believe that every time. Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes we are healed. You see, a person that has joy in trials will believe that, receive it, and then claim it. A person without joy Praise it, but reluctantly. God, if it's your will, heal this person. I don't know if it's, if it's on your docket, you know. If it's on your agenda, Lord, I know you got a lot going on. <laughs> By golly. No, that's not a person that has a renewed mind. Amen? We need to have a renewed mind when it comes to that. Matthew Henry says this, The devil endeavors by sufferings and crosses to draw men to sin and to deter them from duty or unfit them for it. But as our afflictions are in God's hand, whose? God's hand. They are intended for the trial and improvement of our graces. I like that. So think about it like this. You're going through a hard time. God, why is this happening? Because God loves you. Isn't that good? I love that. Because it's a total, it's a total mind shift. Because we're so used to just going, oh, this thing again. But God says, hey, I'm using this to make you better, to make you greater, for the greater trials to come. Why? Because in James it says we're his prized possession. Why are we his prized possession? Because of the cross. You are bought at a greater price than you'll ever know. And so it's worth it that we would submit ourselves to faith and endurance so that we can be better. For who? For God. The byproduct of that is that you'll have a better life. Your situation may not be better, but you will be better. Is that good? Matthew Henry also says this, when the work of patience is complete, then the Christian is entire 
and nothing will be wanting. It will furnish us with all that is necessary for our Christian race and warfare and will enable us to persevere to the end. And when its work will be ended, this is good, will be crowned with glory. Come on. So the things that you go through now, they're only preparing you for a crown of glory at the end. If you'll submit yourself to faith and endurance, testing of your faith to build your endurance, when you stand at the end of your life before God, you'll be crowned with glory because you persevered to the end. Amen? Kevin Paul Scott says this, if we view problems as the end of the world, we will fail to rise to the challenge and we will miss the opportunity to grow. But if we realize problems are a part of life, that they're the classroom where we learn valuable lessons, we will embrace struggles instead of resenting them. Like we've always said, embrace the grind, right? Is that good? Point two, don't waver, don't quit. Say don't quit. Don't quit. quit. It's not worth it. James 1, 5 through 7 says this. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So what is waver? It's a verb, meaning something that we do. To be undecided between two opinions or courses of action. You see, what's interesting about this verse, and this blew my mind as I was doing this, is there have been many times in my life that I've prayed for God to give me an answer, and he didn't respond. So naturally, you think, oh, well, maybe it wasn't the time, maybe it wasn't God's will. No, it's not it. What it was is that I had other options on the table. God, bless my finances, but while you're doing that, I'm going to go take out a payday loan. <laughs> no? No? Anyone? This thing's a little bit? Hey, that's for my own life. I did that so many times. I paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars needlessly on stupid stuff like that because I wouldn't trust God. Anyone else ever done that? Let that be a reminder right, that we should not waver. Matthew Henry says this, there must be a sound believing of the great truths of Christianity and a resolute cleaving to them in times of trial. That faith which is spoken of here as tried by afflictions consists in a belief of the power, word, and promise of God and in the fidelity and constancy to the Lord Jesus. What that means, all of my chips are on Jesus. It's not something else. If your loyalty is divided, The Bible says you should not expect to get anything. How come I'm not being healed? Because you don't trust God. How come this is not happening in my life? Is your loyalty divided? Are there other options on the table? That's a great question to ask ourselves, right? Because here's the thing. There's no gray area here. There's no alternative. It doesn't say, well, if your loyalty is divided, then God will do some things and not others. But it's when you ask, ask with your whole heart. Don't let your heart be divided. Is that good? So we need to stay loyal to the Lord. People that waver have not decided fully on the Lord yet. And like I said before, our flesh always looks for an out. Your flesh doesn't want you to live a godly life. It will do everything it possibly can to get you to do the alternative every time. And this will trip you out. Sometimes the alternative looks like the things of God, but it doesn't mean that it is. Let me give you an example. You have sin in your life, and you feel conviction to go before the Lord and repent. But the flesh says, hey, just go to church. You'll be all right. Is that good? No, it's not good. Because the flesh says, hey, just go to church, surround yourselves with the things of God, and you'll be okay. But we know that's not true. Because it doesn't deal with sin. Right? So we need to stay loyal. Put all of your chips on Jesus. Don't leave any other options on the table. Be resolute. Too many times people give up just before the Lord brings an incredible breakthrough. I've had that so many times in my life where I look back and go, man, God was about to do something so great. 
I think about all the advances in my life, and it's, it's not even that this was the time that it was maybe necessarily meant to happen, but there are a lot of things that have, have, have advanced. They should have advanced many years ago. The problem was me. Because I didn't trust the Lord. All of my chips were scattered. Right? I had some on, on red and black. It was all over the table trying to get the best odds. But I needed to put all my chips on Jesus. Amen? And no one says this is easy. But the great thing is that God affords us the grace to do it. And the more we increase our endurance through the testing of our faith, the easier it becomes to have the right attitude. How many of you guys go to the gym? It should be a whole lot of people in this room for February, right? <laughs> How many of you guys are going to start going to the gym? Yeah, there you go, in faith. <laughs> it's always hardest to start, isn't it? Like, I hadn't been to the gym and too long to count. But as I started working out, it was hard at first. It's like, man, my body's like, no, man, just be fat and have fun with that. You know, just <laughs> let it be what it is, baby. You know, you good. But I was like, no, I don't want to do that. It's funny, but it's true. These are the conversations I have with myself. And, um, but as I started to work out, it was, you feel that sore. You get sore, right? And you're like, oh, oof. oh, I don't know if I can do it again. But then the more you do it and you're stretching, your body's getting used to it. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. So then what do you do as it starts to plateau? You put more weight. You put more resistance. Why do you put more resistance? So you can become stronger. Okay, spiritually, God is doing the same thing. So don't waver and don't quit. If you'll stick it out, the Bible says in James 1.12, blessed is a man that perseveres under trial. For when he stood the test or received the crown of life, the God has promised to those he loves. That is us. It's hard at first, just like working out. But the more you do it, the stronger you become. And like working out, it becomes visible. And people will be able to see it. Testing requires patience. You guys like that word? Nope, I don't. The word patience is also written long-suffering. Our sufferings develop us when we have a renewed mind. How do we have a renewed mind? The cross, right? So always remember that. The way you have a renewed mind is through the crucified life. So you need to be patient and let it do its perfect work in you. Matthew Henry says this. Now to exercise Christian patience aright, we must, one, let it work. It's not a stupid, but it's an active thing. Apathy and Christian patience are very different. Have you guys ever gone through something you just said, I'm just going to go through it? It is what it is. You guys ever said that? Yeah, I've said that a lot too. You see, when you become apathetic, it's the compromise. You either submit to the trial and let God work it in you. You reject it and do what your flesh wants. But then there's this weird middle ground where people have just become stoically apathetic to it. They say, I'm just going to do what God wants me to do, man. I'm going to stick it out. I'm not going to learn anything, but I'm going to stick it out. <laughs> it's like, well, you're missing the point, bud, right? Because we need to submit ourselves so that God can increase us. Being apathetic to your problems is just as bad as running away from it. It does you no good. So let us take care in times of trial that patience, not passion, be at work in us. Whatever is said or done, let patience have the saying and doing of it. Let us not allow the indulging of our passions to hinder the operation and noble effects of patience. Let us give it to leave, work, leave to work, and it will work wonders in the time of trouble. We must let it have its perfect work. Like we said before, God's using trials in your life, whether you've brought them on yourself or they're designed to make you better so that you be perfect and complete, not lacking a thing. Amen? How many of you guys lack some stuff? I do. I'm looking forward to the day that I lack nothing because of my submission to the process of faith and endurance. See, the great thing about going through trials is that it teaches us to depend on God because after all, he knows how to get through what you're going through better than you do. <laughs> how many of you guys have asked other people for help in your trial? 
hey, man, uh, I'm going through this thing financially. What do you think? Oh, man, what you need to do is subsidize, blah, 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 this and that and the other thing. God will bring people to help you in, in your storm, but you need to start here. God knows what you're going through. It's crazy that a lot of times that we don't ask him. Isn't that weird? We're like, oh, well, I know how to deal with this. I've done this before. Hey, man, just trust God. He wants to help you. It even says that. If you lack wisdom, ask who? Ask God. Why? Because he wants to give it to you. It is crazy that we don't ask. Isn't it weird? It's kind of like if, um, if you needed 20 bucks and your dad had 20 bucks, and you knew that he wanted to give it to you, but he didn't ask him. And so then you started walking around the street asking other people for money. How weird is that? Just ask your dad. He'll give you 20 bucks. I need 20 bucks. Is your dad here? <laughs> James 1, 5 through 6 says this. Oh, no, sorry. We already read that. I apologize. Uh, in the message version, it says this. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believingly, and without a second thought. Without a second thought. Loyal. All my chips on Jesus. Every time. Amen? Kevin Paul Scott says this. He says, human nature wants to avoid stress at all costs. When we encounter difficulties, we instinctively ask for relief. And we want it now. Our ultimate purposes, however, are much bigger than our comfort. God often uses crises to teach us life's most important lessons. Listen to this. Difficulties strip away the thin layers of self-protection and denial. So don't try to hold up under it. Give into it, and you'll be better for it. Amen? Point number three. Do what the Word says. What's the Word? The Bible. Yep, you guys got it. James 1, 22 through 25 says this. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and... If you do what it says and don't forget it, then you'll be blessed for doing it. Is that good? Let's break that down a little bit. So how does God bless us in all these things? Through our obedience. If you seek to have joy, if you seek to have a renewed mind, if you do all these other things but you don't do what God says, you've wasted your time. Why is that? says, there must be inward practice by meditation and outward practice in true obedience. Matthew Henry says this, it is not enough to remember what we hear and to be able to repeat it, give testimony to it, commend it, write it, and preserve it. But it's this, in order to and which crowns of rest that we be doers of the word. It's not good enough that you know. It's not good enough that you can recite it. It's not good enough that you can write it down, put it on your Facebook with a nice image. It's not any of those things. You can Instagram the Bible all day long. If you don't do it, it's worthless to you. Isn't that wild? You may not like that, but that's the Bible. Because you can't. It's simple. God says, hey, I know you guys that created you. Your flesh is going to try and find all sorts of alternatives. Well, I've been watching these pastors online. Get in the word. Well, you know, Joel's seen this. Get in the word. Do what it says. Well, you know, I follow this Instagram account that gives me a lot of great Bible stuff every day. Get in the word and do what it says. It doesn't give any other option. If we want to be blessed, then carefully look into the perfect law that sets you free. And if you do what it says and don't forget it, then God will bless you. Man, I want God to bless me. Do what he says. Yeah, but that's real hard. Then you're not getting anything. <laughs> Isn't it wild? I love it when people are like, man, I just want God to bless me. And I just, I do all these things. I pray a lot. And, you know, I really think about it. It's like, well, are you doing what God says? Well, no. Then it doesn't make any sense. 
It's weird. It's weird to me. I think it's weird. It does us no good to hear all about the power of the cross. It does us no good to come to church to hear about the power of the renewed mind. To hear great preaching on the renewed mind, the cross, all these things. It does you no good if you don't do it. Right? It's like going to the gym and then not working out. Why do you have the membership? You look weird. Go home. <laughs> just, some, just some overweight guy, you know, having a protein shake, looking at all, man, that looks hard. Right? It's like, go home if you're going to do that. But if you're going to go to the gym, get in the gym. If you're going to do, if you want to live a Christian life, then do what God says. There's no other alternative. If you want God to bless you, what a God, what's God going to bless me in? My finances, my family, you want kids? Well, get with God, man. You want a godly spouse? Then do what God says. You want promotion? You want all these things? God outlines all this stuff in the Bible. Yet we constantly try to find alternatives. Well, I heard from a friend, he heard a great pastor, and this is what that pastor said. I don't care, man. Get in the word. It's the best thing for you. You need Jesus. You need the word. You need to submit yourself to the process so that God can make you better, so that you can be blessed. Amen? Because we don't want to go through this life and waste it and say, well, it was hard. <laughs> it's, it blows my mind. All right, let's keep going. Matthew Henry, I love Matthew Henry. This is what he says. The use we are to make of God's word may be learned from it being compared to a glass, which he's talking about a mirror, in which a man may behold his natural face. As a looking glass shows us the spots and defilements upon our faces, that they may be remedied and washed off. So the word of God shows us our sins, that we may repent of them, get them pardoned. It shows us what is amiss, that it may be amended. So when you're at home, maybe it's been a long day. I think girls do this more than guys. I don't know, I do it kind of a lot too. But you go home and you're looking in the mirror like, orale, my mascara's off, right? And you're just like, your makeup's kind of a mess. And so what do you do? When your makeup's a mess, you clean it off, right? Because otherwise you look like a sad clown. Uh, and then, you know, I think about every day when I wake up, I go to the mirror. And it's like, man, is there anything on my face? Because I, I don't want to walk around with some sort of volcano, you know? So you deal with those things. It sounds funny, but we take great care of our appearances. Is that right? And if you don't, we can work on that. But <clears throat> the mirror that we use at home shows us the things that are off so that we fix them. And we do. It's natural. It's, we don't even give it a second thought. You clean your face. You brush your teeth in Jesus' name. You do all these things in the mirror to make sure that you are right. The word of God is your spiritual mirror. Man, I don't know why I feel this way. Do you get in the word? No? Well, if you want to know what's going on with you, get before the word. The word has no emotions. It's unbiased. It will show you for what you are. But why does it show you that? Not to make you feel bad, to make you better. You see, the thing is, when you, look at your, when you look at your spirit in the mirror, you can then determine the things that are amiss, the things that need to change, so that you can be better. The word frees us from the old things, frees us from sin and shame, from unnecessary weight. It allows us to continue and grow in this life that God has given us so that we can be effective. So do what the word says. Amen? You want to grow in your Christian walk? You got to do what God says. There's no shortcuts. The flesh will try and find you a shortcut. Well, look at this devotion we found online. It's super emotional. You'll like it. God's love is like a breeze. It comes in and out, equipping the man for good. Like some sort of weird stuff like that. We don't need that stuff. We need the word. Go to the cross. Die to yourself, renew your mind, allow your faith to be tested so that you can increase your endurance because it's going to continue to happen. So you want to be stronger when the next trials come. And then do what God says. Trust me, God's desire 
is not that your life would suck. You're his prized possession. How do you take care of the things that are your prized possession? How do you take care of your kids? How do you take care of your house, your finances, the things that are important to you? Think about how much care you give to that and then recognize and realize that God is giving even greater care to your life. If you'll submit to him, if you'll allow your faith to be tested, and you'll stick it out in endurance because all your chips are in Jesus, he will grow you, make you stronger, and make you better. Because the thing is, is that it compares it to a trophy that we're like his trophies. He wants to put us on display. You may not see yourself like that, but God sees you like that. You're not worthless. You were worth it. I was worth it. So Jesus died on the cross, and he gives us a process to make us better. It is practical, completely doable, if you'll have a renewed mind. Amen? So when we live that crucified life, we have a renewed mind that chooses to have joy in the midst of difficulties. Why? Because our faith is in God alone, and it knows that he's going to use trials to make us stronger. See, when you understand that God is going to use it to make you better, it's much easier to embrace it. When you have a renewed mind, you understand that, that your mind won't waver, your life won't waver. It's loyal to the Lord completely. It puts all of its hopes on Jesus and depends on God to give wisdom and direction in the midst of its trials. It leaves no other options on the table. Take all of your options off. Let Jesus alone be your option. And finally, it's obedient to do what the word of God says. It doesn't just listen but it does it. How do you know that you're growing? You do what God says. Amen? Come on, let's be standing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, that you understand us better than we understand ourselves. And because of that, you're always willing to help us. Lord, I pray right now that you would will in us to do the great things you've called us to do. Lord, and in and, and part of that, God, that we would be willing to do what you've called us to do. Lord, we'd be willing to submit to your process. We'd be willing to ask you for wisdom. Lord, I ask this morning that this word about increasing our faith, increasing our endurance, so that you would seal it in our hearts, that we wouldn't forget it. Lord, that we would be people that do what you say. Lord, that you would start to show us all the wonderful things that you have for us. Come on, with your heads bowed and your eyes shut. Lord, I ask right now for every single person in this room, Lord, that you start to remind them of your goodness, God, of your faithfulness. Come on, if you're in here and maybe God gave you a dream a long time ago, maybe it was for your family, maybe it was for promotion, whatever it was, but this morning you came here and you felt like that dream was dead. I wanna tell you that a God-given dream doesn't die. And this morning, that if you'll submit yourself back to the testing that God wants to take you through to make you better, you can start to believe again that God's going to do those great things in you. As you apply your faith, believing all of your chips on him to fulfill it. Lord, thank you so much for your promises. Thank you so much for your word. God, thank you so much for your love. God, that your love disciplines us so that we can change to be better. God, that you love us so much that you gave us the cross, that you gave us Jesus, not only to set us free, but to empower us to walk the life that you want us to walk, to live the way you want us to live. 